Welcome to An Apple a Day, a podcast, a resource, a community. Share your experiences and learn from others as we overcome barriers and learn to live a happy, healthy life with a disability. Welcome to the community. Here's your host, Jimmy Apple. Welcome to another episode of An Apple a Day. I'm your host, Jimmy Apple. An Apple a Day is brought to you by www.famousapple.com. Famousapple.com is the home site for this podcast. So if you get a minute, go over there, check it out. And while you're tripping around the web, stop by our groups page at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash disabled living. That's going to bring you to a page that says living with a disability. That's an Apple a Day page. And there you're going to meet some nice people from around the world. And they're having conversations. They're asking questions. They're answering questions. There's some poll questions on there. Go over there. Check it out. Have a good time. So how are you feeling today, my friends? You're feeling good? You're feeling strong? You're feeling better than you have been? Excellent. You can't ask for better than that. Hey, what about your doctor's appointments? Are you keeping your doctor's appointments? It's very important, especially now with this COVID-19 coming back for round two, this coronavirus. This is no joke, my friends. This is absolutely no joke. Make sure you're keeping your doctor's appointments Keep them virtually. As many as you can keep virtually, do it. The same thing with your rehab. Keep up with your rehab. It's very important. Keep your body strong. Get back what you lost. Don't lose any more. And if you have to have food brought into the house, have it delivered. Plenty of grocery stores are delivering. You, you got services like Peapod, ShopRite, Shop at Home. Call the call your local local grocery store and see wh- what they're delivering, who's delivering. Get it delivered to you. Try to avoid the public as much as you possibly can. And if you can't, masks. Wear your masks. Wear the, the latex gloves. Protect yourself. Wear eye protection. Protect yourself. We're breaking all kinds of records. There's hospitalization records. We got more people in the hospital than we did last May right now. Do you believe that? We have hospital shortages, hospital space shortages. People are in parking lots. It's ridiculous. And people will still tell you COVID's a hoax. You know what? We need something positive. And I got something positive for you today. Have you ever heard of Linda K. Olson? If you haven't, you're going to be glad you're here today. Linda Olson is a medical doctor. But not only is she a doctor, she's also a mother of two. Now, not only is she a doctor and a mother of two, this woman is a triple amputee. Now, unlike me, my amputation came from diabetes. Her amputations came from being hit by a train. Yes, you heard me right. She was hit by a train in a Volkswagen bus. I have an interview that you're not going to want to miss. And now, let me tell you this. This woman could be one of those people, woe is me, woe is me. Not in the least. Not only did she learn how to walk on two prosthetic legs, she went on to become a doctor. She went on to become a mother of two. That's right. She has an unbelievable story, not just of survival, not just of determination, but a story of love. Believe me, this interview is going to leave you wanting to hear more. And you know what? You can, you can read more by buying her book. It's called Gone. It's available at Amazon and wherever books are sold. This book, I read it. I read it before it came out. And it's one of these books that you don't want to put down. Trust me. My wife was calling me saying, come on, dinner's ready. I said, I'll be right there. I'll be right there. And I kept on reading. This book is one of those page turners. And you're going to want to read it. I read the book in two days. That's how good it is. It's a great book. And (laughs) you got to look at the titles in the book. There's one title in particular. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Although in the interview... Linda tells you the meaning of the title. And the title of the chapter is called Tits and Ass. (laughs) You're going to want to hear this interview. Believe me. So sit back. Relax. I'm telling you, you're going to enjoy this. So without further ado, let me introduce you to Linda K. Olson. And we 
we're here today with Linda K. Olson, and she has a new book out called Gone. And believe me, you're going to want to read this book. This book is by far one of the best books I've read in a while. You read this book, I can guarantee you, you're going to laugh, you're going to cry. And in that order. <laughs> Hello, Linda. How are you today? I'm so well. Thank you so much for inviting me today. I've been looking forward to talking with you. Thank you so much for being here. Linda, I don't know how else to explain this, but I am so in awe of you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, I hope you don't mind. Linda had an accident many years ago that left her a triple amputee. That's right. I said it. A triple amputee, not, not a single amputee, not a double amputee, a triple amputee. And not only is she a triple amputee, she is also a doctor, a medical doctor. She learned how to give IVs with one hand. One hand. <laughs> That's amazing to me. She also is the mother of two children, a son and a daughter, and she is married to her husband for how long, Linda? 43 years now. 43 years. Unbelievable. <laughs> so, Linda, go ahead. Tell us how this all came about. Well, it started uh, on a very nice afternoon in Germany back in 1979. My husband and I were on vacation traveling with his parents and his brother and wife. And we were in Germany uh, in a borrowed VW van. Had had a wonderful day. In fact, the highlight of the day had been the climb up the highest steeple in Europe in a city called Ulm. And Dave and his brother and I had run up this steeple, and uh, I could keep up with them. And then just a few hours later, I ended up on a railroad track after we stalled or our van stopped on a railroad track and we got hit by a train. Oh, my God. The, the part that is, I, the part that was memorable to me was the men were in the front seat and they were able to get their car door open as we saw this train coming and they got out quickly. The three women were in the middle and I was unable to get that VW van door handle to open. So I rolled over into the front seat thinking, oh, there's that open door, I can get out. And when I got to the front seat, I tumbled out and fell. Thankfully, Dave, my husband, had just glanced back and saw me fall, and he turned immediately, and he ran back up on the track, and he actually leaned down, grabbed me, and had me in his arms when the train hit the van. At that impact, it threw him back, and I was dropped onto the track. I was pinned under the van and pushed down the track by the train and the van. And when they all came to a stop about 30 seconds later, the engineer actually backed the train up. Passengers all got out and they pulled the van off of me. Oh. So <laughs> now I never lost consciousness. So I could hear them, I could see them, and I could see them looking at me and the, the one scary part was when I heard them talking and I thought, oh, no, I've, I've had my head injured or something because they were speaking gibberish. <laughs> <laughs> Not really. They were speaking German. And they got a ambulance there very quickly and were able to put tourniquets on my extremities. And as I remember them, I could put, picking me up to put me on the gurney uh, into the ambulance. I could see them pick up my foot, put it on the gurney, pick up part of my leg and put it on my, the gurney, and inside my sleeve was my arm, which was detached also. So, in a way, the first blessing in disguise, I think, was the fact that I never lost consciousness, and I knew from those first few minutes what had happened. It didn't diminish the impact, but it, it I think, left me without the wondering and the concern and I was lucky that I never had traumatic episodes didn't you know you know I didn't have any PTSD over it but I was lucky enough that they called ahead got me to the trauma hospital in Salzburg Austria where there were five surgeons waiting for me and by the time I got to the emergency room <coughs> pardon me um, they were ready to take me into the OR and 
hospital that did nothing but deal with trauma. And they were so apt and experienced that I had, when I came out of the surgery, I was, I was out of there in that hospital. I was there for three and a half weeks. I never had any infections. My skin healed well. So to be honest with you, the very worst part of the whole book is in that first chapter where everything gets cut off and from there on, we start going uphill. Of course, after the accident and after the surgery, I spent a few dark hours in the ICU there in that hospital by myself. In fact, there were no other patients in there, as I recall. And I spent the rest of the night wondering and worrying. And all I could think of, I knew what had happened. I worried about my husband. We'd been married for not quite two years at that time. I was 29 years old and he was 27. And all I could think of was he wasn't going to want to stay married to this severely disabled woman when he had married someone who was, you know, active and cute and a doctor with him. We had been medical school classmates together. And so I had memorized a couple of sentences and I thought when I see him, I'm going to, this is what I'm going to say to him. When he walked in the next morning with his cast on his ankle, he had broken his ankle when he was thrown back along the train. I looked at him and I said, I've been thinking. I said, I'll understand if you don't want to stick around. And he walked over and he put my hand in between his two hands and he just said, I didn't marry your arms and your legs. If you can do it, I can do it. And I must admit, I'm sure that both of us cried at that point. God bless him. But I also, yeah, I just thought, you know, I'd known him now for probably five or six years and I thought he's a man of his word. He's a very black and white person and he's not going to say something that he doesn't mean. In fact, he's kind of a man of few words at times, and if he does say something, it's probably meaningful. And I think right from then, I thought, if he says that, then that means I've got the challenge. I need to make this work, and I'm the only one that can make it fail. So my job from the beginning was, since there was nothing else I could do, was to look at the people around me, his parents and his family and my family as they got on the airplane and came over to the hospital, was to get them to look at me. I mean, they would walk into the room and they couldn't look at me and mm-hmm. they just looked despondent and teary and I became obvious to me that my job was to cheer them up and convince them that we could, we could do this. And um, I wanted them to be able to laugh. I wanted them to be able to you know, not not give up on us, and I wanted them to be on my team and be able to help. So that was kind of my mindset within probably the first two or three days was that was my job, and it's that, become a lifelong job, which is a good job. That's excellent. That's absolutely excellent. I mean, most people would give up, honestly. Or not, well, maybe not give up. Most people might feel like giving up. Well, you, you, there's, it, you know, it was, it was very black and white, and the fact that I knew what had happened, I couldn't fool myself, and, you know, I could look down, and that's the publisher that, that published the book. She's the person that came up with the title for this book, actually, um, and when she sent it to me, I went, oh, my goodness, that's the title. She said, I reread the chap, the first chapter, and what I was left with was every time you looked down, you said they were gone. And that's exactly right. And it was such such a definite place to be. They weren't going to grow back. I had no choice but to start learning how to do things with the hand that I had left, which was now my non-dominant left hand. That was and my I next question. What, yeah. Which one, did I, which one did I prefer originally? Oh, <laughs> I would have preferred my right. <laughs> right. But um, it, you... I realized that there were going to be a lot of things I couldn't do. And it became obvious that I needed to quickly figure out how to do things with only one hand. And that took up all our waking hours for the first few weeks. Because what I really wanted was to be independent. I really wanted to be able to take care of myself so I wouldn't be a burden on people, which I think is a normal feeling for most of us. Exactly. And if you've got that goal, then I think you, it gives you a purpose. 
and it gives you not as much time to lie around going, oh, poor me, and why did this happen? And that was the other thing was we decided early on in that first few, that first week that it was going to do no good to try and find out why mm -hmm. or blame somebody. Um, those things were just done. It was just it was too much energy to be angry about things, and it was going to take all the energy that we had to work on the things that needed to be done. So that was that was what we tried to start from right there in that first week. That's excellent. I mean, now, do you have do you you well, I know you use prosthetic legs. Yes. Do you use a prosthetic arm for your right arm? I, I do not. I never tried to get a prosthetic arm, sometimes to my husband's dismay. But I think what happened to begin with, I, I was medevac back home uh, about three and a half weeks after the accident. And my husband at the time was active duty Navy, was doing a residency in radiation oncology here in San Diego at the Naval Hospital. So when they flew us back home, and I was hospitalized for about two months there, the first thing I told them, I said, I want to walk. I don't want to be in a wheelchair the rest of my life. And so I convinced them to bypass, although they did have me try little stubby legs, which they try, which is actually a good idea for many people. They little tiny short legs right. to get you up and standing. I did not like them. I found them hard to use. So I said, let's just get on with it. I want to be my regular height again. So I put all my energy, and it took a lot of work. I mean, I'd go down to physical therapy two times a day and spend a couple hours, so I was exhausted. And I really wanted to walk. I was able to walk within the first four months. I was able to walk a mile. Excellent. And I think during that time, I had learned a lot about using just one hand. And I think what you learn quickly is that your other hand, your non-dominant hand, is used for holding. And those first three weeks when I was in the hospital and had nothing else to do, I started looking for things to hold paper when I wanted to write. I spent time trying to open a milk carton and eating with one hand and balancing things and stabilizing them. Right. And... The final blow was after I'd been home for several months, and we did talk about getting an arm, was my my right arm is off right below the shoulder. So essentially, you can look at me, and I look normal if you just see my me from the shoulders up, but um, to put an artificial arm and to have it stay on with that very short stump of an arm, they would have to put straps across my chest. Right. And a very vain 29-year-old female I was at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, you know, I'm not a, I, my boobs aren't very big, but, you know, it'd be nice to be able to show some cleavage once in a while. <laughs> and uh, if I have those straps on all the time, I'm going to be sweaty and hot, and they're going to be in the way. And I'm going to just give it a try without an arm. And so here I am 41 years later, and I don't have an arm. And I think if you look up the literature about people who lose just one extremity and that being one of their arms or part of their arm or their hand most people don't use a prosthesis because it doesn't really reproduce what you've lost um, I, back then all i could have used were hook was a hook and i just thought mm, you know i'm just going to leave it the way it is so i was just going to say that to you i have a very dear friend of mine who lost his left leg and his left arm when he was 12. And he got the prosthetic leg, but he's now, he's now 65. But he never, he did get the, he got the prosthetic arm. Mm -hmm. But it was the one with the straps that went across your back. Yep. And, and uh, he never, ever, ever used it. Never. Yeah. yeah. Never. And like you, he had the, the small lever right below his right below his uh, shoulder, mm -hmm. and never he said it was the most uncomfortable thing he ever used, and to this day he still doesn't use it. Well, thank you for validating my decision. You tell him I said thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he drives, he does everything else, but he uses he has his left leg, you know, the left prosthetic, but never ever did he ever use the prosthetic arm. Well, and I have a very intact, 
strong left arm and all five of my fingers, and uh, I just you just you figure it out. Well, you you, know you, the, you must because you're doing in, you're doing IVs with your left hand. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a good story. Um, my I had a year off a, med, a year of medical leave from my residency. I was nine months away from finishing my radiology residency. Wow. And so I, once the, that year came up, I had to get back to finish it. Otherwise, I mean, they're very strict about whether you fulfilled the right number of days before you finish and take sure. your oral exam. So I got back, and one of the things back then, if you were a radiologist, you had to inject the, or you had to place the IVs to put uh, just about the time that CT scanners were coming into use. This was 19... Uh, I went back to my residency in 1980. So back then in California, radiology technologists were not allowed to start IVs. So the radiologists or the residents had to go in and do it. And I had to do it. So I remember being called into my attending's office one afternoon, and I kind of trembled back there and thought, okay, what have I done wrong this time? And he was sitting at his desk, and he had all these IV you know, butterfly IVs and tourniquets around and then one of the techs and he said, okay, Linda, you're going to start an IV on me. And I went, I'm not going to do that. He <laughs> said, well, you're not going to be a radiologist if you don't. And he was a big six foot six, big set New York guy and very blustery and I had no choice. And I remember the tech tied the tourniquet around Dr. Sanders' arm and he had huge veins. We call them pikes when they're that big. <laughs> And I remember just sitting there, and I started to close my eyes. I thought, no, you can't do that. you got to look at what you're doing. And I got it in. And it was funny. I got home that weekend because my husband was living in Los Angeles. I'm sorry. I was living in Los Angeles doing my residency, and he was living in San Diego doing his residency. And when I got off the train that night, he said, okay, you're going to keep practicing. And he had brought home a tourniquet and a bunch of butterfly IVs. And... He made me start IVs, probably, oh, a dozen of them on him that weekend. Really? Because he was determined that I was going to be good at this, and he figured no one else would be that patient. So I just didn't want to do it, but he didn't give me any choice. And there were a lot of things like that in my rehab that he was the he was the extra push. He was the person that when I needed to be buoyed up, he'd say, uh, you can do it. And there, he tells me, he reminds me that there were many times that I would get up and say, do I really have to do this? And he would say, yep, you've got to do it. So, you know, I was a team, it was a team effort. And that was one of the big reasons I wanted to write the book was because this wasn't just me. This was, sure, I had a lot of get up and go and I was a pretty upbeat person, but, you know, and I'm sure I would have done okay, but I would never have had the, the amazing opportunities that I had as a, for a career and a family and travel if it hadn't been the two of us. So, yeah. Well, throughout your, throughout your book, you can tell it's a team effort between your husband and your daughter and your son. Yep. I mean, the whole family, is, is pulled, you have one strong unit there. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting because the kids were both born after the accident. And, in fact, <clears throat> you know, pick up a little of this as you read the book. Mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't planning on this, but we went back to Germany to visit Dave's parents nine months after the accident. And, oh, by the way, I that... got pregnant on that trip. <laughs> <laughs> that was and, a productive, uh, productive it was, trip. Yeah, my husband said he thought that was a good idea. I wasn't sure it was. Cause <laughs> I, was I really was worried that uh, bringing children into a family with such a you know, severely disabled mom would be, you know, a recipe for disaster. And, angry children that would be, you know, fighting the perception or embarrassed about their mom and dad. And I'm sure there were, like any kids, my husband said, you know, when they get turned 16, they're going to think we're dinosaurs anyway. Of so. course. But it's interesting, um, and this is not in the book, but when our granddaughter was born, and this was when our daughter was 25 years old, we'd had a baby shower down here in San Diego, and everybody had gone home, and there were maybe eight or nine people still sitting around, and I was holding Sierra, who's my granddaughter, in my arms, cradling her in my left arm, and I was sitting in the wheelchair, and I looked at Tiffany, and I said, 
does this make you nervous? Do you think I'm going to drop your baby? <laughs> looked at me and said, well, uh, I don't, I never, you know, that does, I don't think so. And there was a moment of silence, and we kind of looked around the room, and I don't remember if she said it or I said it, but I think it was her. She said, you know, it just isn't an issue. And we both realized that we had never talked out loud about my disability. And people find that weird or not quite believable. But the kids grew up thinking this is the way everybody is. They, You know, when you've got a six-month-old or a year-old and they're riding around on your wheelchair, mm -hmm. they think that's normal for a period of time. And once their lives were just like everybody else, and that was, that was my goal from day one, was I wanted a normal life. I wanted to go back to my job. I wanted to live independently. I wanted to have kids. I wanted my husband to stay around. So when you focus on making things normal, I think it didn't leave a lot of opportunity for, oh, woe is me, uh, things that, you know, you could have complained about. Dave was so supportive. For example, food. You know, I'd make dinner every night, and if the kids didn't like it, he would just look at them and say, you know, your mom took her a long time to fix this dinner tonight, and if you don't like it, you can go upstairs to your room, and we're not making something different. Yep. So uh, I think they realized, especially as they got older and we started camping and traveling, that their life was more normal or more maybe above normal or out of the ordinary than other kids' lives. Exactly. Exactly. They couldn't, uh, there wasn't much, we just didn't talk about it. They, it, it became second nature that they knew they had to help and that they watched out for me and things like that, but that was just the way our family was. Like so, you said, second nature. Yeah, yeah. It was part, it was part of the deal. Now, yep. I have to ask you this. <laughs> In your book, in, what is it, Chapter 9, the title of Chapter 9 is Tits and Ass. <laughs> yes, it is, isn't it? <laughs> okay, now let me tell you about the chapter titles, because when I wrote the book, I actually started out about eight or nine years ago writing. This was after I retired, and I was really just writing stories. I didn't particularly start out writing a book. But after a few years, I realized, well, maybe this should be a book. And so I had a series of stories that, um, with the help of a development editor, we kind of strung them together in the order that you see them so that they actually had an arc, a story arc. Mm -hmm. I had no chapter titles. Well, I had, you know, chapters. I had story titles, but they didn't. They, you know, were just descriptive. You got some so, doozies in here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, and you know, I, Kristen Iris, who's a, she lives up in Boise, Idaho. She's the person that helped me, and she came up with almost all the titles. But the tits and ass title, <laughs> we were sitting at a table one day, and Dave came up with it, and she just started laughing, and she said, that's a great chapter title. In fact, she says, that would be a great book title. And we kind of laughed about it for a while, and my son heard about it a few weeks later, and he was, I don't know, he was probably in his late 20s at that point and he said <laughs> he said well if I saw a book like that in the bookstore I'd pick it up and look at it. <laughs> so you know I think we decided it was not exactly the way we wanted the book to come across because it probably has to be an adult book I was just going to say that, it's but... <laughs> in the adult section <laughs> and in a way um, I have to admit there were a few months that I was just a little uncomfortable with it and I just thought eh but as time went on, I thought, you know what, that's okay. It's a little bit of a grabber, and it is the chapter, I think, where we, you know, I had, I had written a couple of different stories about each of the children being born. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, when you write a book like this, my intent was to show that you could have a family and have a disabled mom. And it wasn't, uh, I'm going to backtrack here for just a minute, Many of the books that I read about trauma victims or patients or people were written within three or four or five years after their accident. So there was still a lot of unknown about how they were going to 
do. I mean, they had succeeded so far, but I, and this is why I had never really wanted to write a book. You know, we're just having a normal life. But it got to be 35 years out, and I thought maybe my message should be the validation of staying together and helping each other and going ahead and having children. And that was what I wanted to show. So if you're going to do that, you might as well touch on the topic of sex because in not in great detail, but that's one of the parts that people are going to wonder, well, you can't leave that out of a book and exactly. validate the fact that you had a family. So Exactly. So there's a little bit of, you know, how each of them were conceived in a very gentle fashion, um, which maybe that's why they don't want to read the book. I don't know. <laughs> but you know what? Um, and that's why that chapter was put in there, because those are the things that make our life normal, you know, learning how to drive, you know, having a family, building a house. Um, so, yeah, so I do like that you know what? title now. I've been, given, I've been given books to read, and people want to people want, want me to, talk, you know, push them on, on the podcast and a lot of the books that you get from people, that, that, because people know the Apple a Day podcast is about disability, but I try to look for the positive part of disability, people with positive attitudes like you. But a lot of the books that are out there are people that have the woe is me attitude. And they're going to tell you the most horrible things about their disability. Yeah. They want to give you the horrible things that happen to them. You know, I was, I, I, I just read a book that somebody got hurt at work, and you would think that this was the Holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> a box fell on them. Basically, yeah. is what happened. But to yeah. to read the book, and it's something like I didn't read the whole book to be honest with you. It was something like three hundred pages about a box that fell on, oh. them. and what they went through in the hospital, and oh my God. Well, but, you sound just like me, and that, that was what put me off about reading memoirs of, of tragedies. Right. It's not always just accident. I mean, it can be eating disorders. It can right. Be, it and can so many people dwelling on the negative. badness. Exactly. And I thought, you know, there's so much badness in the world or horror or sadness um, that we, we need more of the... This your book? How, yeah. How do you how do you feel better after something bad has happened? Your, uh, that's you know bad happens, but how do we feel better afterwards? Your book, yeah. put it this way, the only thing for the only thing that could be worse than what happened to you is the people burst in with machine guns and <laughs> just started shooting. But you have such a positive attitude, and what you I mean you explain what goes on after the fact. All the positive things that gone had, that have gone on after the fact. I mean, you're a doctor for Christ's sake. <laughs> and you, you, I'm sorry to keep on bringing this up, but you're giving IVs. <laughs> I just had to go for an MRI today, and they oh, had, okay, well then it's on your mind. <laughs> exactly, and they had to give me an IV contrast, and it took them twice to do it. Yeah, yeah. And here you are with the left hand <laughs> doing this, and it just amazes me that. You know, you, you you are so positive, and anybody that wants to read something that's uplifting, this book, Gone, is by far, you'll read, the, I read the book in two days. It is a quick read. I think that's an advantage to it, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you don't want to put it down, because you'll turn the page and say, uh, I'll read it later, but you turn the page and you go, well, let me find out. <laughs> and I got to, <laughs> and you keep on turning. I like that. If, I'm telling you, it the book the book is a page turner, and yeah. it's not it's not doom and gloom. When you when when Kaylee first Keely, I think her name is Keely, when she, uh -huh. when she first sent me the press release, and I was like, wow, you know, it's terrible, triple triple amputee, and then she's I said, you know, she sent me the book, and I was like, I hesitated reading it at first, mm -hmm. and then I said, well, I got to read it. And I started reading it. And I couldn't put it down. I just couldn't put it down. It's so positive. And I, I talked about it on the podcast, you know, a while ago when I first got the book. I was talking about oh, it. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. And you know what I thought made the book come 
together so well, uh, and we didn't start this way, but the fact that I was able to bring my husband into it, and I'll tell you how that happened, because he's more emotional about this than I am, and he's uh, he's a rough, tough person in many respects. He's, uh, he's a radiation oncologist, so he's able to make life, I think I said this before, into a lot of black and white. Right. Deep underneath, he's got a heart that just bleeds. And I would give him a chapter, and I'd say, can you look at this? Is this correct, or do you think it reads well? And he'd go sit on the couch, and I'd look over there, and there'd be tears coming down on his cheek. And I'd go, Dave, don't cry. I said, this guy, I'm not going to give you any more chapters. I don't want you getting <laughs> sad about this. And he'd say, no, 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 I've got to read this. And then he would go down and sit at his computer, and he would start typing. And he <laughs> There would be a single space, no paragraphs, and it would be two or three pages of just run on, just go, go, go. And he would pour his heart out. And I would take some of those. I looked at them later, and his writing is so different than mine. It's I, I call it gut-wrenching, very visceral. And mine is kind of more happy-go-lucky. And when we looked at him, I said, I really want some of his pieces in there. And at first... People said, oh, no, no, this book is about you. And I said, no, mm-hmm. this book is about us. Exactly. And the four that we chose, they're not very long, but they just, they're kind of the glue that that put the emotion into it of, and let his voice come through. And then, as you may have noticed, there's a prologue and there's an epilogue. Mm-hmm. And the prologue, in fact, that is writing class at UCLA, just to, it was an, just a writing class. And she wrote a story about her mom being disabled. And when I read it, I thought, oh, my God, it's time. You know, if my 30-year-old grown daughter can write about this, now it's time. So she, that's what prompted me. And she did not write it for the book. But once I got halfway through, I went back and pulled it out, and I thought, oh, my goodness, this is, this is the beginning. This is why... This, this proves, especially when you read the end of it, how she looks at the pictures, that it was okay to have a ki- this kid. And then I thought, well, what you do with one kid, you got to do with the other. So her brother, who is three years and two weeks younger than her, I thought, well, I wonder if he's written anything. And both my kids took a while to figure out what they wanted to do after college. And he had done the same thing. And about three years after college, he thought, well, maybe I should have gone to medical school. So this was part or most of his personal statement for his medical school application. And when I had read it, I had been so awed by what he said about his mom and dad, and in particular about his dad and what he had learned about the human spirit and the teamwork and how his dad had taught him that a person is not their arms and their legs and that and how, how he'd watched this marriage work. And he used that as why he wanted to go into medicine. Of course, both of his parents were physicians. And when I pulled it out again, I thought, that's the end of the book. And it, it, there are the bookends to proving my point, that you can be a disabled parent, and you can have children that grow up. And, you know, they're going to be like everybody else's kids. They have their ups and downs, mm-hmm. and we have our ups and downs. But they've inadvertently written these pieces, not for the book, but for something else in their life, proud of the fact that what they've learned from living in this family. And I just thought that's, that's, that's what ties it together. And that's, that's I, so I, surprising. I think that's what makes it so strong. Yeah. That's so yeah. surprising. I thought that they I thought they wrote it for the book. No, 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 no. My son wrote that back in 2011 when he was applying for medical school. Yeah. And he's older. He's now 36, so he had waited a while to go to school. But it was a very mature way of looking at, you know, what he what he would observed about his parents. So, wow, yeah. that's excellent. Uh, you should be proud. You, I am. You have every reason to be proud. Put it that way. Yeah, and you know they don't turn out the way you think they're going to turn out. They turn out to be totally different people, but they teach us and that's that's the other reason I would love for disabled people to have children because it it distracts you from your disability right. it distracts you from being poor me it it gives you something else to focus on to focus on and it teaches you i mean if you haven't and i i say this kindly i don't know if you have children but yes. i think having children is what 
finishes our personality and makes us become less less self-centered and stuff. So I just I just think it's what finishes it, you know gives it us does. the all around life. Yeah, it does. So it, I want people to do that. <laughs> It does. It, it 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 actually does. It gives you it gives you something to focus on besides yourself. Mm-hmm. Linda, I am I am as I said, I can't help but repeating myself. I am in such awe of you. There's, a, there's okay. I mean, all your accomplishments. And but all I wanted to do was be normal. And <laughs> I just want a normal life. Isn't that what we all want? And I mean, no. No notoriety. I didn't want notoriety. I just wanted to have. I and that's to go to how, work, come home. Oh, and, and that's how you get it. When you don't yeah. want it, that's how you get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you, uh, yes. <laughs> you know, the people that want it, those are the ones that try too hard. Yeah. And you, I mean, you you're you're an inspiration. You are an inspiration for people that are looking. I mean, I know people right now that are sitting there looking and going, "What am I going to do?" People that are that have just gotten hurt or just find themselves being becoming disabled and they're looking at it and they're going, what do I do next? Yeah. And I'm going to recommend that they read your book. I, well, that was, that was why I wrote it. And it's, I, I realized that what helped me early on was being able to think or remember people that I'd seen or heard about that had had something bad happen to them. And it's that attitude. If they can do it, I can do it. Exactly. Um, and to be honest with you, what the other part that kind of got me into pushing to get through with this was when I got diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And I finally realized that maybe there was a real audience out there, the people that were older like me now, and, you know, were facing changes in their life that they didn't know how to cope with and which are going to be downhill for the most part but yeah. it doesn't it doesn't mean that you can't still get out and go and do things and that you just learn how to do them a little differently exactly. and as time goes on you keep changing and part of the challenge is how am I going to figure out how to do it differently and oh if I can't do it anymore well then I'll find something different to do exactly um, so I really thought maybe that that was what finally pushed me and made me realize that this is maybe my message is um, this you know you can look funny, you can act, you can walk funny, your hand might not work, you may have a tremor, uh, you may your face may not smile like you want it to, but you can still have a good time. You just well, set your mind to it. So I'm a firm believer in that there's no such thing as a disabled person, just a person with a disability. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, if you can just keep keep remind yourself of that, because. There's obst- everyone has obstacles. I don't care whether you're able bodied or you're crippled. Everyone has everyone has an obstacle. And you just have to learn to go around the obstacle. That's all. Yeah. Well, and you know, I think uh, I think my timing for this book having come out the end of October, which is only about six weeks ago, mm-hmm. is totally uncanny that we didn't think about at the time was COVID. Exactly. <laughs> and I think all of us did pretty well for the first three or four months or five or six months. And I got to tell you, it got to the end of the summer and started into fall and Thanksgiving. And I think, I don't care who you are, I think it's getting tough to cooperate and it's getting tough to think there's a good reason to cooperate because this just is such a shitty thing. It is. I think people are starting to want something that will just cheer them up a little bit. It's, you know, it's, we can't fix everything. We can't make things go back to normal. I can't make my legs grow back. Exactly. But we can figure out how to, to be positive at least once a day. <laughs> <laughs> Not all the time, maybe, but exactly. Yeah, so, Ex- yeah. Exactly. Now, I want to ask you, I know that your book is available on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Where else is it available? You know, it's actually available through most major bookstores. Um, in fact, I encourage people to check with their own local independent bookstore because they can order it. They may not have it on the shelf, but it is readily available through the major uh, distribution center, so they can order it. 
Uh, so Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and, and independent bookstores. And I just found out today it's going to be made into an audio book. So I don't know how long that takes. Excellent. But, uh, that was a surprise to me today from my publisher. So um, give it a few weeks or months. I don't know. Well, but yes, you should be able to get it any anywhere that uh, books are sold for the most part. Well, I know we have a new. Our website is being reconstructed the famous Apple website but when it is we we will have your book on our website as well okay and I have a website if you want to yes, give that out uh, what is it's it w it's just www dot and then it's just my name no spaces Linda initial K Olson so I'll just spell that it's L I N D A K O L S O N dot com Excellent, and I'll yeah. put a link to I'll put a link to that on our website as well. Okay. And I'll put a link to that on our group page on Facebook as well. Awesome, and is that under Jimmy App? The uh, Facebook. Uh huh. Uh, www dot facebook dot com forward uh -huh. slash groups forward slash disabled living, and that okay. brings okay. that brings you to living with a disability and. We have people from around the world, actually, on that on that page. And Great. we have little conversations and questions and answers and stuff like that. Yeah. But, yeah, we'll put a link awesome. on to that. But okay. Linda, thank you so much for being with us today. I've been it's looking forward to talking, to talking with you. Thank you. And uh, I hope that between the two of us, we can uh, help people... Uh, feel better about their situation definitely i'd love to talk to you again sometime well let's do it De definitely without a doubt let's do it all right all right thanks again for being here today and i'll talk to you soon sounds good have I a great weekend you too So what did I tell you about Linda Olson? Is she amazing or what? Here she is. She's a survivor. She's a doctor. She's a mother. She's a wife. She's a triple amputee. The woman is amazing. I'm in awe of this woman. But buy her book because what you just heard is not the entire story. Buy her book, Gone. It's available on Amazon and whatever books are sold. The name of the book is Gone. And visit her website, www.lindakolson. That's all one word, L-I-N-D-A-K-O-L-S-O-N.com. Visit her website. Very, very, very nice woman. Very nice. Very nice person. Hey, listen, thank you for stopping by today. And I want to remind you, no matter what, things can always be worse right now there's someone somewhere wishing they were in your position so things can always be worse my friends you've been listening to an apple a day my name is jimmy apple and remember this no matter what no matter what the illness no matter what the ailment the best medicine is laughter i'll talk to you again later on during the week have a good one <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to An Apple a Day with Jimmy Apple, your gateway to a happy, healthy life. Join our community at www.famousapple.com. See you next time. <laughs>